I'm Haley B. Miller, and this is Ohio Politics Explained, a podcast where you give us 15 minutes and we give you all the news you need to sound smart and impress your friends. Welcome to another episode of Ohio Politics Explained, the DNC edition. Today, we're talking all about Ohio Democrats who flocked to Chicago this week for the party's convention. The Buckeye State didn't get quite as much attention as we did during the RNC, but there was still a lot going on. Joining me by phone today is Jesse Balmer, who's been on the ground in Chicago all week. Are you still awake? That's a good question. It definitely reminds me of like your first day of school where you show up and you're trying to find the classroom only for four days straight. But we're making it. It's the final day. Yeah. And I imagine now that it's the last day, you actually know where you're going now. Good timing. Product improvements have been made. So Vice President Kamala Harris and her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, don't have ties to Ohio. We're no longer a battleground state. So in a lot of ways, Ohio kind of faded into the background this week. But two Ohioans did get speaking slots, Cincinnati Mayor Aftab Perival and Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Are you ready to put people over politics once and for all? Well... The air of joy and freedom is up on us. And now it is on us to go seize it. As Beatty showed, everyone in Chicago has been quite excited. Jesse, what have you been hearing from Ohio Dems about the significance of the DNC and Harris's nomination? Yeah, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm surrounding the Harris and Walls ticket from Democrats. This was a change. These people thought that they were coming to Chicago and signed up to be delegates to support President Joe Biden. But uh, just a little bit ago, he decided to end his re-election bid and endorse Harris. So there's been a lot of change. There was a short, very short period of time where we thought we might have an open convention. But Harris really locked it up extremely quickly. And you're really seeing younger voters, voters of color, just individuals getting more excited about this ticket than perhaps they would have if it had been Biden. And you did a really interesting story, I thought, about how Ohio's black female delegates are responding to Harris's nomination, given the historical significance of it. What, what did you hear from people like Beatty and others? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting to speak with some of the women who were really trailblazers in Ohio for black female politicians, and there's more than are in that story. But people like Baby, who was told that she couldn't run for House Minority Leader because she was black and a woman and, and was able to win that spot over white males um, and help bring Democrats back to power. People like former lawmaker Barbara Sykes, who... I'd be back to work about two weeks after she gave birth to her daughter, Amelia Frumsight, who ended up being a congresswoman. So it was interesting because a lot of these women thought that this moment wouldn't come in their lifetimes. And so it's surprising and I think encouraging for them that it did. Yeah. And then, you know, every day, as they did with the RNC, the Ohio delegation has breakfast, gets together hangs out before they go to the main convention hall. Have there been any standout moments for you at those breakfasts? One thing that was interesting about the breakfast was on Tuesday, former Ohio Department of Health Director Amy Axon showed up and started confirming to reporters that she was considering a bid for Ohio governor. That wasn't a person who was a delegate, not someone who we necessarily were expecting to show up, but I had heard some rumblings that she was at least considering or looking at a bid, uh, she was definitely making rounds, sitting right next to former Ohio Democratic Party chairman, David Pepper. So that was interesting. Probably the best speakers came on Tuesday when uh, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty was in charge of booking the lineup. And so she had, you know, Cory Booker and, you know, a variety of other kind of national figures. But I will say the party's rising stars, the people who might run for president in 2028 or 2032, they're not swinging by Ohio this week. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think that goes back to us not really being in play, at least in terms of the presidential race. Obviously, Senate's a whole other ball game, but it is intra. It does say a lot as to who is and is not showing up at the delegation breakfast. Yeah, I'd agree. And you actually spent some time with uh, Senator Sherrod Brown this week back in Ohio. He decided not to come to Chicago uh, because he wanted to campaign in his race in Ohio. And the party chair, Liz Walters, was saying this morning that Sherrod Brown already had the votes of everyone in that room. He was back in Ohio trying to win the votes of some other people. Yeah, and he was asked about his decision to skip the DNC when he was in Toledo the other day. Here's kind of the pitch that he made about it. We decided four months ago that this race is hard, and I'm going to stay in the state, and I'm going to continue to, to do my job. And my, I essentially have three jobs. I, I run a Senate office in a big, complex state. I chair a major committee, the Banking Housing Committee, and that's how we were able to write the Fendoff Fentanyl Bill with Tim Scott, the ranking member. On that because that comes out of that committee, uh, and then I have this campaign, so um, I, I'm not complaining about any of those. I choose to do all three. So it sounds like delegates haven't said much about Brown's absence. You know, they're still supportive of him, but I mean, what do you feel like it says about the election that he's facing that he decided not to do this? Yeah, it says that at the top of the ticket, despite the enthusiasm nationally and perhaps internally in parts of Ohio for the Harris Wall ticket, that, that is not going to be enough for them likely to win the state of Ohio. It's expected that former President Donald Trump is going to win the state as he has twice before by eight percentage points. And so really the best thing that Harris can do for Sherrod Brown is to keep this race competitive. Because Sherrod Brown is a skilled politician. He has a lot of national financial support. He's really only lost one political race in his life. So if the top of the ticket can keep it close, he has a good shot here. But if it's a blowout for Donald Trump in Ohio, that's going to be a bad day for Sherrod Brown. Right. And... You know, I think Brown in the past has been able to appeal to Republicans and even Trump voters. One of the sheriffs that was with him in Toledo this week was a Republican sheriff who thought really highly of his work dealing with the southern border. But I think it is probably more challenging for him with being on the same ticket as Trump. So, you know, while he has endorsed Harris and has commented on her focus on working people, kind of a similar focus that Brown has in his campaign, I think he would be perfectly fine if reporters didn't ask him about the presidential race for the next three months. Yeah, and this might change, but the Harris campaign isn't investing robustly in the state of Ohio right now. I believe they've bought some ads in like the Toledo and the Youngstown area, but really that shows more that they're trying to win Michigan and Pennsylvania than they're trying to win Ohio. Yeah, I think the down ballot races really are the the star of the show for Ohio. Actually, speaking of those races, another really vulnerable Democrat in Ohio, Representative Marcy Kaptur, she ended up showing at the DNC to hear Tim Walls speak on Wednesday, but it was kind of an open question heading into this week as to whether she would be there. Yeah, I would say we didn't know that Representative Kaptur was coming until really during the last minute. Uh, she ultimately decided to come on Wednesday. She was at the Ohio delegation's breakfast on Thursday, and you know there were people cheering, Marcy, Marcy, Marcy. I know Democrats don't want to count her out. She has been in tough races before, and this district is significantly more competitive than the one that she used to run in, a stretch from Toledo all the way to Cleveland. This is a race that Republicans certainly can win. That was not the case this last election, where uh, Mr. Majewski was not a competitive, not a viable candidate. So we'll see if uh, Derek Marin can unseat the longest-serving woman in Congress. Yeah, so let's pivot again to 2026. 
The governor's race was the elephant in the room during the RNC. Lieutenant Governor John Husted and Attorney General Dave Yost are already openly campaigning to replace Governor Mike DeWine, who, as our listeners probably know, is term limited, so he can't run again in 2026. We know less about who the Democratic candidate will be. You mentioned that Amy Acton was there this week. Who else was in Chicago, maybe laying the groundwork a little bit? What other names are out there? Yeah, so another person who comes up quite frequently is the top House Democrat, Allison Russo. Russo has said that she's focusing on this year's election. She has House races that she's trying to get Democrats elected to, but she did tell me that her she doesn't see her political career as ending once she's done with her term, which I believe is 2026. And so you could see her trying to make an effort. She was really prominent in the redistricting fight and, uh, you know, abortion rights in Ohio. It's a little bit hard because she is in the Ohio legislature where Republicans control everything. But some of her colleagues say that she punches above her weight in that role. I will say after that and Amy Acton, who certainly there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, behind her as a person who, honestly, Governor makes the line made a bit of an Ohio celebrity by having on his daily calls about the COVID-19 pandemic. But she earned a lot of support from Democrats and maybe people who felt reassured by her advice. But she also earned a lot of scorn. There were people who were protesting at her house. There were attacks on her family verbally, um, not physically. So she's really a polarizing figure in Ohio politics, and she has no political experience. She considered a run uh, when... Senator Rob Portman came open when he decided not to run again. So she's a bit of an unknown politically. There are other people who could make a jump, but really it would be a jump. There are uh, mayors in Cleveland and Cincinnati and Columbus who have done well locally, but the question is whether they could run statewide. And then Tim Ryan, who ran in the Senate race in 2022, has said that he you know, wants to put this in his family right now and, and really isn't looking at 2026 until Cleveland.com. So the bench is not wide. Maybe the bench is not deep. There are options, but they're not as obvious as what the Republicans are putting forward. Yeah, and I think it just... It's this goes back to the simple fact of Republicans really dominate state government in Ohio. So you don't have the logical next in line, like you said, Yost, people who Republicans who have already been elected to a different statewide office. So it'll be interesting to see, because I think even Russo, while she is among one of the more prominent Democrats, I don't know that she's super well known outside of Columbus, just because not a lot of people can rattle off the name of the House Minority Leader. Yeah, I will say Liz Walters, who again is the chair of the Ohio Democratic Party, is really hoping the Republicans to kind of do their own in this primary, but it's just going to be such a bloody and bruising primary for both John said and Dave Yost and whoever else decides to enter that race. Democrats will have a shot at the end of it, but I will say we've had a lot of kind of bloody and bruising VIP primaries recently that have turned out okay for the Republicans. And one more thing before you go. In less important DNC news, or potentially the most important, Dems nominated Harris to the tune of John Legend's Green Light. The internet wasn't completely behind that choice, and Frankly, neither was I. Like, no disrespect to John. I just really love the Black Keys. I will say my inside scoop is that the Ohio Democrats did not suggest green light. Liz Walter, he's from Akron, suggested gold on the ceiling by the Black Keys. And Senator Bill DeMora, who is in the party leadership, and a Columbus and Ohio State fan, suggested hang on to the So you can blame the National Democrats for that. Ohio Politics Explained is brought to you by the USA Today Network Ohio Bureau. You can check us out on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Ohio Explained. 